Thank you, uh, Jimmy, very much. Um, you stole my line about Bob looking down and smiling at us. Um, yes, he would have. Um, before I get started, there, there are just a couple things I want to say, and I do want to say I don't have to be doing this. I hope I'm not doing this well into my 90s, because <laughs> I've been doing it since 1974, and it can get discouraging. But I do agree with Andreas. I agree with, with a lot of people I've talked to on the ship, is that we really do need a strong grassroots movement. We have to move the powers that be up here. Um, so that we can stop giving the kind of advice we've been giving that of making not only our country sicker, but uh, we're exporting it to the rest of the world. Um, but Bob would have um, enjoyed everything he heard here. I'd hoped that Veronica Atkins could be here, but she had to cancel because she had other commitments. She has said she wants to be here next year. Veronica can get really discouraged after all these years and, and feeling like we haven't made enough progress, and I think it would have been wonderful for her to be here, to hear, the, hear these stories, to see the presentations, and to know that even though next year will be 10 years since Bob passed away, that the work that he started to do decades ago is it, still being carried on and we are making a difference in people's lives. So um, I just want to say that and thank everyone for, for everything that they've shared. So we're going to talk about carbohydrate addiction and is it real? Um, I am a carbohydrate addict. I realized that when I was in my 20s and started to work with Bob, but I could look back on my whole life and realize I was a carb addict. And I didn't know why I had difficulty with certain foods, whereas other people could have one cookie walk away, and I would have to keep going back and eating the bag until they were gone, even if I felt started to feel sick. So I am a carb addict. Um, I am uh, a sober carb addict, I guess you could say. Um, <laughs> I also had some other cross addictions, which I'll talk about later, to caffeine and to nicotine. Uh, I don't worry about those anymore. I have recovered completely from those two addictions. But the, the carb addiction is something that you have to keep on working with all the time, I think. Um, I'm not afraid anymore of losing control, but it is still a decision-making process I have to make every single day when I am making decisions about food. How many people here know they're carb addicts? Yeah, okay. You can only come on the ship if you're a carb addict on this thing. <laughs> How many people think they might be, but they're really not sure that there is such a thing as being addicted to carbs? Oh, just a few. Well, the, Jimmy, there's not anything for me to talk about. Thank you um, very much, Jimmy. <laughs> so um, I am going to talk about whether there's evidence that it is indeed true. Because I can remember over the decades I worked with patients, I'd have someone come in and say, and actually use the word addiction. I'm like an alcoholic. I can't control carbohydrates. What do I do? And I am going to end with talking a little bit about what you do do in case some of you here still are dealing with that and from some of the stories we heard this morning. Um, it, it is an ongoing process because it's very easy to reestablish your addiction because you can get your chemistry riled up again if you reintroduce specific carbs. So I want to talk about that. But um, it is a controversial subject in medicine. There are still a lot of people who say you, you can't possibly be addicted to sugar or carbs or even addicted to food. Um, I got a nasty letter from a woman once after Mary and I had written um, Atkins Diabetes Revolution and we used the term addiction uh, in a number of places in that book and this lady wrote a letter and she said how dare you use that kind of a serious word when it should only be related to people with addictions to alcohol and to cocaine or to heroin or whatever. Um, Food addiction, sugar addiction does not exist. It isn't serious enough to be called an addiction. Um, and those of us in this room know it can be very serious enough to be called an addiction. It can eventually take your life. But it is still somewhat controversial, but I hope I can uh, offer some evidence that we've learned a whole lot more in the last number of years. But the British Medical Journal in 2005 had no doubts. They said that sugar is as dangerous as tobacco and should be classified as a hard drug. It is harmful and addictive. So I just want to give you some ideas of, of what you find as far as definitions of addiction. Dictionary.com is a state of being enslaved to a habit or practice or to something that is psychological or physically habit forming. Think about this when you think about your own difficulty in controlling certain foods and whether that applies to you. 
and it can be so habit-forming that to such an extent its cessation can cause severe trauma. A medical dictionary, habitual psychological and physiologic dependence on a substance or practice beyond one's voluntary control. Now the American Society of Addiction Medicine just recently wrote, rewrote their definition of addiction. After four years of meetings with specialists in the field, this is what they have come up with. And they have said addiction is a chronic brain disorder characterized by what happens in the brain, specifically the midbrain, but not just limited to the midbrain, which I'll talk about a little later. But it's a chronic brain disorder. It's not poor character. It's not no discipline. It's not that you're a bad person. It actually is a disorder. It affects the neurotransmission and interaction in the reward or pleasure circuitry of the brain. And we'll talk a little bit about that. It will lead to behaviors that replace healthy behaviors. That sounds like something a lot of us have done with food. And even previous memories of experiences with things like food, sex, alcohol, and other drugs can trigger cravings. Just the memories can trigger cravings that can renew the addictive behavior. There is a subconscious Pavlovian response that can very quickly be set up between a particular food I'll make a confession. I don't even know if I've ever told my husband about this. We'll be married 39 years in a week or so, so I have had my secrets. But back in the 70s and the early 80s, before I really came to grips with, even though I started low carbing in 1974, before I really came to grips with having to just give up certain things forever, because I kept testing whether I was going to get away with them or not, when my husband would be at a meeting, I didn't have to make dinner that night, I would start to think all day at the office, oh goody, I could go home and my trigger was Entenmann's Golden Fudge Cake. <laughs> and I didn't even make dinner, I would come home, I would put on comfortable clothes, plop in front of the TV, on the way home I would have brought my treat, and I didn't even cut it or take it out of the box. I had a fork and the box, and I would sit there and that would be my dinner. And I have a terrible blood sugar, and I knew I did. So I knew by doing this, I was going to get sick, and I, I did. So I would stop eating for a while, and an hour later I'd go back and finish whatever was left, and I would pay for it for days. I have never done that since 1985. I learned how to give up my Entenmann's Golden Fudge Cake addiction. but. Just even thinking about it, I can remember how I used to sit there and go through this process. And I had no control over it once it started. So how do we learn to love sugar? Because we do. Um, we know from very early in life, infants are given sugar water to calm them if they're in pain, if they're in stressful uh, circumstances. So it does begin in the womb uh, by swallowing amniotic fluid. And it's thought that maybe this attraction to sweetness is an evo evolutionary process that was to help the organism, us, to distinguish taste so we could avoid poisons that might be in our environment. Because in nature, poisons are generally not sweet. So if it was sweet, it would be okay. Breast milk is sweet. The mom's diet will affect both the amniotic fluid and the breast milk. And what we found, and we know what mom's diets are generally like, since more than 50% of women when they get pregnant are overweight or obese these days, um, that a varied diet gives children an experience with different flavors. But if the diet isn't varied, if it's high in sugar, if it's high in carbs, if it's high in processed foods, you're also passing that attraction on through the amniotic fluid and the breast milk possibly to your child. We know that Babies who are breastfed are more willing to try different flavors, whereas babies who are bottle-fed generally are not. 